In August 2010, our cargo ship carrying 492 Tamil migrants was intercepted off the coast of British Columbia. Their dangerous ocean crossing then led to an intensely difficult road to become Canadian. Writer Sharon Bala was inspired by their stories, which have now become the basis of her first novel. It's called The Boat People, and Sharon Bala joins us now for more. Hi, Sharon. Hello. It's incredible that this is your first novel. It's incredible that it's here. <laughs> it's such a good, it's like it's so much research in it. Uh, the, the storytelling is fantastic. Thank you. Um, you said that you wrote the novel as a meditation on empathy. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Oh, uh, well, I think for me, putting myself in these characters' shoes, and in particular in the Hinden shoes, required so much empathy. That was the only way I could do it was literally to feel myself in his body and think about what it, that would be like. He's a man. He's uh, a, par a parent. I'm not a parent. I'm a woman. He's come through this horrible situation with war in Sri Lanka. I was born already out of the country. I grew up here in Canada. And so every single part of his experience was so foreign to my own mm -hmm. that the only way I could write him was really to really imagine that I was him and to put up all these obstacles in front of him and then ask myself, what would I have done in those circumstances? And hopefully by the end of the conversation, we will have an answer to that question. Um, <laughs> but as you said, the book is sent, uh, set on a character by the name of Mahindan, mm -hmm. which is a fictional name. Yeah. Um, but he arrives in a boat, which actually happened. It's called the mm -hmm. MV Sunsea. Yeah. Um, so why tell the story that way? And why this particular story? What about it? Originally, it wasn't supposed to be a book about refugees or war. Uh, I was going to write this story about a multi-generational Sri Lankan uh, Canadian family, and I was going to set it here in Toronto. Mm -hmm. But then I thought, and I wanted to really write about what happens when one generation comes and they raise a second generation in you know unaccustomed earth, and then how um, parents and children don't really understand each other and sort of the, the difficulties that can lead to. And then I, I sort of wanted to have uh, this boat come on the West Coast and have the characters here talking about the boat. And it was always going to be a story that had multiple points of view. And then at one point I thought one of the points of view should be actually a person from this boat. And then I, I moved the story. And then when I was doing the research into the MV Sunsi, which inspired the fictional boat, there was so little there that I really had to make up every character from scratch. So I invented this character. I gave him the name Mahindan. I gave him that name on purpose because it's a name that is both Tamil and Sinhalese. Uh, it's also easy to pronounce. Um, and you know, once he came on the scene, he really insisted on being the center of the story. What happened, for the viewers and for us to right. get a better sense of what happened, they're on a boat because of a conflict back in Sri yes. Lanka. So what happened? Why did they have to leave? So Sri Lanka had, um, in 2009, when the book begins, the fictional book, Sri Lanka had just come out of a really brutal, almost 30-year civil war, which was waged between the majority Sinhalese and the minority Tamils. And sort of to give you some background, so in Sri Lanka, these are the two main ethnic groups. They have different languages. They have different religions. For, uh, throughout most of the country, they live in different parts of the country. But in the commercial capital of Colombo, for many, many years, for many decades, centuries really, Sinhalese, Tamils, Muslims, Burgers, they all lived and worked you know, side by side. They were friends. Uh, there were plenty of intermarriages. You know, my parents, my mother is Sinhalese, my father is Tamil. Many of the aunts and uncles I grew up with are also you know, in these mixed marriages. So um, what happened? Well, what happened was when the British were uh, when the British had colonial rule, the majority language was English. I mean, the, the sort of language, the official language was English. And then when the British left and they ceded authority back to the locals, there was this real rise of nationalism. Mm -hmm. And nationalism, this is something I play around with in the book, it can be good and it can be bad. And what happened in Sri Lanka was a virulent strain of nationalism, which made the Sinhalese majority look around and say, what are these Tamils doing in these positions of power? Why do they have all the best jobs? Why do they have all of the best positions in the civil service? And so this virulent nationalism rose up. And one of the results of that was things like um, the Singala Only Act, which was a language act that changed the language from uh, English to Sinhalese to Singala, not Tamil. 
And so all of these people who had jobs, who, who were Tamils, Tamil speakers, who also spoke English, like Mahindan's grandfather in the book, mm -hmm. suddenly found themselves without work. Mm -hmm. And so then there was this, and um, so, you know, the British left at the end of the 40s, and then through the 50s and 60s and 70s and early 80s, the ethnic tensions were just rising and rising and rising. And uh, Tamil politicians said, you know what, if we can't live here with equality, give us our own country, separate off the North and the East. And so there was the separatist movement that began with diplomacy, but a younger generation was rising up who saw that diplomacy wasn't working. And those are the Tamil Tigers. And those, they became the Tamil Tigers. And so then there was this war which began in uh, 1983. Mm -hmm. It was sparked by this three days. So, you know, I said the temperature was rising and rising. And then in July of 83, it, it kind of blew up with a three-day riot in Colombo where the majority Sinhalese turned very viciously against the minority Tamils. You know, people were doused in petrol and set on fire. Homes were looted. Um, and, you know, to their credit, many Sinhalese helped their neighbors and took them in mm -hmm. and tried to protect them, but it really wasn't enough. And you tell these stories in the book, um, and like I said, it's a very well-researched book. Where did your research start? Did your dad um, help you in any way? Um, I started with books, mm -hmm. and then I actually started thinking about my family. And I live in St. John's. My parents are here. They're mm -hmm. in Pickering. And so I called my father up, and I said, you know, I've heard these stories about what it was like growing up in, in Sri Lanka in the 50s and 60s and 70s, but we've never actually talked about it. Tell me about the... So there were two riots in the 50s, and my father lived through them, and one in particular, the riot of 1958. He was a boy coming home from school on the bus, and he looked out the window, and he saw, as he says, the fellows were fighting, and he didn't know what they were fighting about. And as a 12-year-old kid, he thought it was a lark. Mm -hmm. um, but then he realized it was serious and kind of ran home. And the stories he told me about that riot, I used those and gave the, some of those stories to Uncle Ramesh in the book. It's interesting that you said that you didn't talk about that growing up. And yeah. the, Priya also has that same experience yes. with her, uh, her uncle. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, unusual? It's, it's interesting. So in Priya's story, they really don't talk about it on purpose. They never talk about Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. In my family, everyone always talked about Sri Lanka because we came over, but also all of my aunts and uncles and cousins also came to Canada around the same time. And so I grew up hearing these stories in the background. All the adults would kind of talk and joke and laugh and very dark humor mm -hmm. um, about the things that they had experienced. But no one ever sat me down and said, OK, now this is what we went through. because. I just don't think that they were wanted to give us those. I don't think they wanted to burden us with that, mm -hmm. which is why they use dark humor, I think. Um, but speaking with other sort of, I guess we're first generation, other uh, Sri Lankan people my age who grew up here or were born here, everyone says the same thing. Yeah, they're, they sort of heard about it, but not in any serious, you know, sit down and tell me about it kind of way. Did you include some of your own personal stories in the book beyond uh, what you were just saying about your uncle? Uh, in the opening scene, you know, Mahindan's in the boat and he's jumping over these sleeping bodies um, to get to the stairs to take him up to the top deck. Mm -hmm. And that actually came from a story that I heard uh, over and over and over again when I was growing up. My dad would talk about, uh, in the riots of the 50s, all uh, people lost their homes, like Tamil people lost their homes. And my grandparents opened up their doors. They didn't have a very big place, but they opened up their doors and said, anyone who needs it can come and stay here. And my dad tells the story about being a boy and like having to hop over bodies to get from his bedroom to the bathroom. And I that image, I think, was always in my head. Mm -hmm. And it, when I wrote Mahindan jumping over the bodies, I wasn't thinking about it consciously, but later I thought, oh, that comes from my father's story. And the book is centered again uh, but with Mahindan, and mm -hmm. he has a young child. Yeah. And there's this line that just kind of like drew my breath away. You write, how precarious his existence, how miraculous mm -hmm. his survival when he's talking about his son. Selian. Yeah. Is that how you say it? Selian, yeah. Selian. Um, how did Mahindan get caught up with the Tamil Tigers? So Mahindan grows up. So my parents uh, were raised in Colombo. And so I think a lot of people who were raised in the capital had a lot of privileges and that they were often educated in English and then could leave when things got tough. But Mahindan grew up in a place called Kilanochi, which is the second city up in the north after Jaffna. Um, and as he's growing up, there's this back and because the war was, 
Even in the North, where a lot of the worst damage of the war happened, there was very much a back and forth. There were periods of peace and calm and periods of ceasefire and then periods of brutal tension. And so um, I was researched Kilinochi's history and I sort of placed Mahindan in time. And so for him, his life has always been this series of, of ups and downs. Um, and I think sometimes when you are raised in a place, you just don't want to leave and he doesn't want to leave. And so through the book, in the flashback scenes, you see this constant conversation between Mahindan and his wife and their friends. Should we go? Should we stay? Should we go? Should we stay? And he just stays too long. He just stays too long. And really, you know, the UN leaves. I'm not really giving anything away for three years. <laughs> but the UN leaves, and the Sri Lankan army is coming closer and closer and closer. And then finally, it's the end. And Mahindan leaves with everyone else on this exodus. And they move through the northeast, heading eastward. And this was, I was following a journey that a lot of Tamil people took at the end of the war. You could actually see the Sri Lankan government released uh, drone video footage from above. And you could see this like physical migration of people moving east. And he just gets caught at the end. And what happens to the people um, can become quite graphic in the yes. book. Um, there was one scene where uh, a man has a traumatic amputation. Yes. Uh, your research uncovered these terrible stories. Mm -hmm. How did you decide what to include and what to leave out? So after I had done the nonfiction research, mm -hmm. I then had to think about the emotion. And I had to think about how to craft the story and I always think it's better to write the story that you would want to read. And for me, I like to read stories that have a balance of, of hope and despair, of comedy and tragedy. And so I look to other books like Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's mm -hmm. Half of a Yellow Sun. I look to Joy Kagawa's uh, Ubasan. I look to Kim Thuy's Rue and Chris Cleave's Little Bee. And these books all deal with you know different things, but, but war and loss and, and tragedy. And they take different paths in terms of how much darkness and light. Mm -hmm. And so that, that scene that you're talking about is a very dark scene. And it's bracketed, if I'm remembering this correctly, by lighter scenes in, on purpose. Mm -hmm. But I, did want to, I didn't want to shy away too much. And I did want to put the reader in this difficult position about having to read difficult things. Because these things happen to because people. Because these things happen to people. And for us as readers, we can take a break. We can close the book, put it aside, read something else, or go away and then come back to it. But for people in those circumstances, there is no break. And I want, and part of that meditation on empathy for me as a writer mm -hmm. was forcing myself to be in those positions. And so I think, I hope that readers, when they read those scenes, um, that even if they need to take breaks, that they come back to it and, and, and force themselves to confront the truth of what happened. You went to Sri Lanka last year. I did, after, this time last year, yeah. So after writing this and going <laughs> there, what was the experience like? I submitted the final version of the manuscript to my editors on April 3rd of last year, and then a week later, I went to Sri Lanka. And I had never been to the north, because the north had always, like in the book, there really was a cordon, there was a no man's land, you couldn't go up there, and certainly not as a tourist, it was not safe. So I had been to Sri Lanka, but not the north. And then the day after Sri Lankan New Year, which happens in mid-April, I took this, uh, this car journey from Colombo in the south all the way to Jaffna, which is almost at the very northern tip of the country. And I fell asleep in Anuradhapura, which is still kind of central and is still very touristy. And then I woke up and the landscape had completely changed. And it, you know, the south is, is lush and there's just lots of people and it's vibrant. And the north is very desolate. The people are gone. There are no people there. So it's very open spaces. And then the flora and fauna are actually very, it's a small island, mm -hmm. but the flora and fauna are completely different. different yeah. So, and there were like these open paddy fields and farmer's fields that had left to go fallow because people are dead or have left because there are landmines. Uh, and the, the landscape was still marked by war very much. And it was actually, a, it's a very emotionally difficult journey. I can imagine um, too for yeah. your parents, they must have been. I wasn't with they, my parents. But how actually, were they yeah. feeling about you going? 
they were, I think they were pretty worried. I didn't, so I was in Sri Lanka with my husband for a total of two weeks. We were in the north for a total of three days. And on all three of those days, my uncle in Colombo called every single day to check on me. And I didn't realize until, I was thinking, why is he calling? Mm -hmm. I, I didn't realize until afterward that he was worried about me, even though there's nothing to be worried about. Yeah, the war, the, you know, the war is, is over and there's a, a really big military presence up in those areas. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, in fact, the, the checks that are happening it used to be that you would get stopped and checked all the time. Those are kind of gone. And, um, but I, I, when I was making this journey, I was thinking about my grandmother making that same journey from Colombo up to actually to Point Pedro, which is where my, grand, my father was born, mm -hmm. which is the northernmost tip of the island. So she was making this exact same journey that we, had, we were making. And I was thinking about her making the journey in 1946 and how much excitement there would have been going back to her family to have her first child, and how I felt the opposite, mm -hmm. making that journey north. I was, I was so unprepared for how emotionally difficult that would be. I sort of, it was so difficult to be in a place that I know meant so much and was filled with so much happiness for generations of my family. And those people are all, we're all gone now. We've all like left Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and it was, Difficult, too, to look at people and think, what have you lived through? And that could have been me so easily. At one point, we were staying um, we were staying in a hotel in Jaffna, and uh, one of the waiters came up to me, and he, he could tell. like You can tell by people, how people look that they're Tamil or Sinhalese. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, you're from here. And I said, yeah, you know, my, my father's family is Point, Point, Point Pedro, and we're going there tomorrow. And uh, I was telling him we were going to go, one of the things we were gonna go see was a temple that my great grandparents had built. And he said, I know that temple. I live very close to there. I'm from Point Pedro. And I thought, oh, it's like, you just think about, you know, that whole sliding doors. Yeah. Your life With could have been course, my life. Yeah, it could have switched yeah. just like that. It's, um, it's all a lottery mm -hmm. is also what I'm trying to show in my book that the dice rolls and you're born in Canada or you're born in Uganda or you're born in Sri Lanka, the dice rolls and you're born in a time in Sri Lanka where you are like Mahindan's grandfather and there are opportunities. The dice rolls again and you're Mahindan stuck in the north. Yeah, or Selian yeah. Who, as a child yes. trying to survive that situation. Yes. Um, so Mahindan uh, eventually gets off the boat and they're taken mm -hmm. these uh, refugee claimants or migrants. I'm not even sure what the terminology would be. All of those terms, and I hate them all. There isn't a why good do you term. Hate, yeah, why do you hate them? Is oh, as a, a writer, I'm so obsessed with language. Mm -hmm. And I just think, uh, I was in Ottawa, and I was at a um, literary festival in April on a panel, and we were talking about this very thing about language. Why do we call some people migrants, people who come from um, the south and they come up here for a summer to pick fruit in Niagara? Why do we call them migrant workers when we call other people who come here temporarily to work expats? You know, that language is so steeped in certain assumptions. And I, yeah, so when I was doing the research, the word claimant, which is a very legalistic term, kept coming up. The word migrant, refugee, asylum seekers. I kind of hated all the language, and I couldn't, I just couldn't find good words for them. They're just people. Well, at this point, uh, Mahindan is in the detention center, yes. and they're being held in, in the detention center trying to figure out what, move, what happens if they're sent over, if they become refugees. Right. Um, and there's this great passage in the book that I was wondering if you could read for us. Yes. And it's the, it's the first time that he's actually bathing <laughs> and the first time for him yeah. using a shower. This is an example of a time when I thought I need something lighter. <laughs> and so I put this scene in. Uh, this is from a scene called A Good Place. Mahindan stood to the side and cautiously turned the dial. Water burst out of the tap. He put a hand under the spray and felt it was warm. Stand underneath, the newspaper man urged them. Mahindan saw the others following his advice and did the same, holding his breath as he stepped under the falling water. It pelted him hard. He swallowed back a yelp. All he could hear now was the loud gushing, hostile and unpleasant. He rubbed the soap into his skin, working up a lather of small bubbles, months of blood and war all sloughing off in a black river running to the drain in the center of the room. 
Sri Lankan horrors washing away in Canadian waters, disappearing down Canadian drains. So my father and I had a long talk about, I, one of the, you know, one of the difficulties of writing um, about a place and people who you have no access to in real life is that I had to make all these small decisions about what would Mahindan know before he came to Canada and what was his life like. And, you know, even decisions like what is in his bathroom in Kilinochi? Mm -hmm. uh, does he have a shower? I decided no, definitely not, because for the most part, Sri Lankans um, use buckets. Use, use buckets. Yeah. Um, and then I had to decide about whether or not he had a toilet, as we understand, a Western toilet, as opposed to just like a ceramic, you know, two uh, foot feet things and you squat. Yeah. And my father and I actually had a conversation about this uh, where he said, I really think it should just be like a squatting thing. And I said, no, I think I want him to have like an actual toilet. Um, and so, yeah, but I knew always that he wasn't going to know what a shower was. Well, you talked about the horrors of uh, being washed away. Yes. Um, but in actuality, do the horrors of war disappear once people are able to make a successful escape? I don't think so. I really don't think so. And I think we know this from, you know, PTSD, from soldiers coming back from war who have PTSD. And so just imagine if you're not just going to war for a short time and coming back, but if war is your life. And particularly if you're, it's not just the war and he's escaped and that part is the good story, but there's also the tragedy of that is everything you lose, you know, uh, the places where you grew up, the places where you you spent time with your wife or you courted your wife, the place where you got married. Um, if, uh, Tamils are mostly Hindu, and so there wouldn't have been bodies to bury. Mm -hmm. But for many people, there were bodies that were buried, and you, know, you leave your ancestors behind physically and kind of emotionally, and I don't think that you can just get over that. I, it doesn't really wash away with the dirt. We touched on this a yeah. little bit, but the story is told from three different perspectives. Yes. Mahindan's, uh, Priya, who's the yeah. lawyer, yeah. and Grace, who is the adjudicator. Yeah. What were you trying to say by telling this story from three different perspectives? Uh, one of the things I did when I was doing the research was I read the Canadian refugee law textbook cover to cover. I actually read it twice, and then I went back to it over and over again. And it's so, it's so complicated and convoluted, and I thought the only way to fully understand it was to see it from these three points of view, from the newcomer, from the person working on his behalf, that's Priya, and then the person who's, you know, who, whose hands hold his life. His fate is in Grace's hands. Mm -hmm. And then I made a very specific decision from early on that the character of the adjudicator was going to be someone who was visible minority. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't quite sure exactly, like it could have been someone who was Sikh, it could have been someone who was Japanese, but then as I did the research, particularly into the British Columbia's history during the Second World War, it just made perfect sense that it would have to be someone of Japanese descent. Well, Grace is the adjudicator and she has to decide on um, yes. Hinden's case, but um, she, her mother has to remind her of what happened to their family yes. uh, with the internment camps. How is it that we tend to forget our own ancestors' hardships? Ooh, partly because we want to forget, uh, and partly because, as I said, sometimes it, you, you don't sit down with your parents and talk about these things, particularly if there are traumas. When I was doing the research into uh, what happened in British Columbia to the Japanese Canadians during the internment, I found this interesting thing, that the generation who were interned um, as adults, so usually that was the Issei, the first generation, were so traumatized by what happened to them that when it was over, the only way they could get through it was really to think, forget about the past, move, move forward. And there was this great line that I kept coming up against, uh, coming up to over and over again, Japanese Canadian people saying, it can't be helped, it can't be helped, we must move forward. Mm -hmm. And it reminded me so much of a Sri Lankan thing um, what to do, what to do about that. We have to only move forward. And so uh, the thing that I found in the research was that often the Issei generation didn't talk about what happened. Mm -hmm. And it was the Nisei generation, so that's Grace's mother's generation, Kumi, people who either were born after the internment or were children during the internment who didn't understand what had happened, wanting to know. And I found all these great interviews between uh, Issei parents and their Nisei children. Everyone's adults now. Mm -hmm. And the Nisei children saying, you know, look, they don't even want to talk about it. They won't talk about it. And that generation really wanted to know what happened. But I think in Grace's 
uh, particular family, she was raised a lot by her grandmother because her parents both worked. And she was raised to have this sense of, we don't talk about that. That's a shameful thing. Mm -hmm. It's a loss of face to talk about that. And it's better to move forward. There's nothing that can be done. And so Grace in the book comes up against her mother saying, we have to talk about it. We have to research it. We have to remember. And Grace saying, I don't want to remember. And I think often, <sighs> when I was writing the book, one of the things that happened in the real world was our 2015 election, you know, cultural values, all that kind of stuff. And a lot of the people who were voted for those things and agreed with those things were people who had accents that were not Canadian. And I think this can happen. People can come, you know, even on a boat, even as refugees. And then they, a couple of decades pass, maybe a generation passes, they feel very comfortable, a little too comfortable as Canadians. And part of that comfort is forgetting what happened, what you went through. At the beginning of the book, you have this great quote from Dr. King where you say, um, we yeah. all arrive on different ships, but we're all in the same, same boat, boat now. now yeah. What do you hope people take away from reading this book? That's the project of Canada. We're all in the same boat now. And we've mm -hmm. all, unless you're Indigenous, we've all come on a physical or metaphorical boat. And what I want people to realize really is that you know, there's this thing, in all three points of view, uh, a line or a version of a line gets repeated, our kind of people. And I think we have this knee-jerk reaction, all of us, regardless of skin color, to gravitate toward our kind of people and to um, other people who we think are different. And the thing that I hope people understand from reading the book is that we are all the same at heart. Whether you're Sinhalese or Tamil, whether you're a refugee or you've been here for a few generations, we all want the same things. We all want the things that Mahindan and Priya and Grace want, mm -hmm. to live in safety, to give something back to the community and to raise families. Sharon, thank you so much for being here. Thank it you, now. It is no. a fantastic book. Congratulations. Thank you very much. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.